Baltimore is on the cusp of a proud renewal. Now is the time we must change to grow. It seems hard to believe, but months ago, Baltimore's politicians were confidently predicting an economic revival for the city. Come out here to help support you, and you pound the The crisis has put police brutality in the spotlight, left leaders grasping for answers. You gotta be present in the middle of the pain, man. And even set families against themselves. We spoke with Neil Franklin of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He's a 34-year veteran of Maryland law enforcement, a former drug warrior who's changed his perspective after the murder of a colleague to find some answers to Charm City's deepest problems. Hi, I'm Todd Cranin for Reason TV. Uh, we're here with Neil Franklin uh, of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Thanks for having me, Todd. So we've been watching on the news a lot of what's happening in Baltimore, um, the riots and, and the, all the troubles going on there. And I'm wondering, uh, how do you feel that the drug war plays into what we're seeing? We are still attempting to arrest our way out of a public health problem. You know, and, and in doing that, they're making drug arrests for whatever. And as they look for people who, who are either selling or possessing drugs, making those arrests, first of all, those people are not getting the attention that they need which are health services. But in addition, as we come through the city, certain parts of the city, with this dragnet, we're scooping up people who aren't even in the drug game. We're just arresting people. We're stopping people, violating their Fourth Amendment rights. We're searching them in the middle of the street. And many of these people are young people. And when the uprising kicked off a week ago, it was the young people who had had enough, who had gotten out of school, went up to Mandaman Mall, saw the line of police, and their frustrations were just emptied out on that line of police. So you've been in law enforcement for over three decades. You've even run uh, anti-drug task forces in the state of Maryland. Presumably you were for a long time a real believer in the drug war. Mm -hmm. What changed? When I retired from the Maryland State Police, a good friend of mine, Ed Totley, was working undercover here in the Washington, D.C. area with the FBI on a task force. And he was buying cocaine from a mid-level drug dealer, and he was killed by that drug dealer. He was shot at point-blank range. And it was that which started my, I guess, questioning of the drug war as it relates to violence. By this time, I'm working for the Baltimore Police Department as a head of training. And then around that time, I went onto a website and I found LEAP's new website, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. So I continued researching and looking into this problem. So it was, it was recognizing the violence from prohibition policies within our communities that really got me moving in this area of reform. That, that's interesting. And, and also after the murder, um, uh, Martin O'Malley, former governor of uh, Maryland, uh, went to visit the family of uh, Ed Totley. And um, very clearly, it had a very different effect on him than it did on you because you've been very critical of a lot of his policies. And I'm curious what uh, policies of his uh, have contributed to uh, a lot of the problems we're seeing in Baltimore today. As with Martin O'Malley and other law enforcement folks that knew Ed Totley, they vowed to go out and push harder in making more arrests and demonstrating that we're not going to tolerate drug dealers anymore, not really looking deep into the problem and the issue. So with Martin O'Malley, um, started this transition away from community policing to zero tolerance policing. When Ed Norris left and went to another agency, Martin O'Malley again goes to New York and brings in another commander whose career had been mostly about narcotics enforcement while in New York. He immediately formed a 300 person unit, the Organized Crime Division, that would focus strictly on low-level drug enforcement. One-tenth of the department pulling people, men and women, from the district stations to form this unit, renting cars so that we can put these people into these cars, unmarked cars, to go out and make arrest after arrest after arrest. And before we knew it, in 2005, we had 108,000 arrests in a city of 620,000 residents. Now, some of those arrests were of the same people over and over again, but I don't know of any other city in this nation that had that type of arrest ratio. These zero tolerance policies that we put in place 
again, it goes back to the 108,000 arrests in 2005. How much long-term damage did that do to these neighborhoods in Baltimore, to the families in Baltimore, to all these people who now have an arrest record? See, people think that you need a conviction and have to do many years in prison for that to negatively, to, to, to affect your employment and housing opportunities in a negative way. No, you just need the arrest. You don't have to do time because of technology today any business owner can search your name through these many databases on a cell phone and find out if you've been arrested. And if you're in competition for a job with six other people and none of them have ever been arrested, what chance do you have? A final question. Um, based on what you've seen today and our reaction to some of the riots, is there a long-term solution in place or are these just more short-term patches and we're gonna see more of this in the future? I've seen no real long-term plans in place. Again, and, and I can speak to Baltimore, that's what I know, I grew up in Baltimore. You know, I was the head of training for the Baltimore Police Department. I'm still very much engaged in that city and I've watched you know, administration after administration come through that city. And so I go back to the Martin O'Malley administration and every one of his goals have always been short term. Nothing ever was long term. And because he had these short term goals for instant results, for whatever, with no long term view, he left it wide open for long term disaster. And that, so that's what we're experiencing now with the uprising in Baltimore. People are just tired and fed up with how the police have been interacting with young people in that city because of these zero tolerance policing programs that, that we've had. And, and you say you just wanted those short-term measures just to make it to the next level? Yeah, it's, it's quite evident. Um, I remember when I first started speaking with him, when I was the head of training, I knew right away that he wanted to be in the White House. And then you could see with every plan that came down the road under his administration, it was short-term just to get some quick quick results, some quick numbers, and it's all about numbers. It was all about numbers with him. You know, whether it's an image of reducing crime or we made this many arrests, it was all about numbers. You know, he had this one number. We're gonna get the homicide rate down to 175 per year, no matter what it takes. We never met that, but the methods for attempting to do that were disastrous to the city of Baltimore. Now, don't get me wrong, there were some lives saved because we got it down into the 200s. There were some lives saved. But where are we today? Where are we going to be tomorrow because of these short-term goals? And abandoning the community policing piece here. We got a lot of work to do now in bringing police and community together. And I'm not sure how we're going to be able to do that. Well, Neil Franklin, thanks for talking to us. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm Todd Cranin for Reason TV.